All right. Picking up where we left off in our previous Rachel Spate video, um, we were talking about um, a dream prefixed, which is that prelude poem on um, attached to that uh, mortality's memorandum. Uh, so anyway, um, in that poem, uh, Rachel was talking about how about her quest for learning and how she had to overcome so many difficulties and then she used that parable of the talents to argue for why she needed to be educated and share her learning and knowledge with others uh, but then she says but she recently had to stop her educational journey because of um interfering or her gender interfering or her 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 biological sex interfering um providing some sort of interference that made her have to stop and it was published like she lost her mother and she also got married in 1621 so this was published and she got married in 1621 and her mother died like right before so perhaps some of those um interferences maybe were taking over for her mother's responsibilities because her mother died and so perhaps they needed somebody to carry on those kind of domestic duties but also perhaps it's her marriage because she got married that same year and so maybe she had just now all of a sudden become somebody's wife and run a household and perform those you know expect expected uh responsibilities of a wife you know care for the home and um run a household and things like that and so maybe that's what she was saying was interfering with her her learning journey so after this work we actually see no other record of any other works that spate ever published that doesn't mean she never ever wrote again but nothing that we've seen that's been published all right so kind of sad but i do know there's a time and place for everything in people's lives and perhaps her life got you know busy she had to shift focus we see that often um in women's lives especially when they get married and start having children um when they're expected to run the household and take care of every all the kids and things like that um but you know um maybe also should continue to write we just don't know because also women's writings weren't published a lot right and sometimes they'd write and they just put it in a drawer like emily dickinson right and only because those were discovered many many you know, because all those poems were discovered after Emily Dickinson died, fortunately, they've been published, right? But that's a modern era. Well, not modern, modern, but, you know, 1800s. And and Rachel Spade is writing in the 1600s. So I'm always amazed that anything lasts, that we're able to find anything from what people wrote, like, hundreds of years ago, right? Here, she lived over 400 years ago, and we still have two things that she wrote. And she's a woman, right? Amazing, because they didn't give women a lot of opportunities, number one, to get educated, number two, to get published. So pretty amazing that we have these. I feel very, very privileged to have these writings of Rachel Spate. So um, one of Rachel Spate's main claims to fame is that she is the first known woman writer to use her own name to write in English about gender theory and criticism. And that occurs um, in this rebuttal to Joseph Swetnam's arraignment of lewd, idle, forward, and unconstant women. All right, she was responding to that in her a, mu a muzzle from Elastimus. So um, she just used her name and rebutted to all of his arguments, which I think is incredibly brave, right? Even nowadays, we have some women not using their names. Sometimes they'll use a, a, a male su pseudonym right and some women published anonymously because they were worried about being criticized or they were worried about not being published at all or they were be worried about if they did publish what they wrote would not be taken seriously right people would be like oh a woman wrote that you know i'm not going to read it or number four that what they wrote would be attributed to somebody else because people would say oh wouldn't couldn't a woman couldn't write that that must be something she stole from someone or something she's publishing and she's putting her name on uh and 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 things like that happen to rachel all right so it's pretty amazing that she put her name on her work and and she took credit for that rebuttal so it would have been um deemed as number one um impertinent right that she's rebutting a man and number two uh it's just not done that women write at all let alone rebut a man and put their name on it so anyway she was only like 19 or 20 when she wrote this right amazing you know for a woman in a time period when women weren't 
educated for the most part. Um, and she got it published. She wrote this even before she got married. She, like I said, she was only 19 or 20 and she got married when she was 24. So four years, about at least four years before she got married, she wrote and published this. Um, and as I said, it's to Joseph Swetnam who wrote Arraignment of Lewd, Idle, Froward, and Unconstant Women. So by that title, you can tell it's not a very nice treatment of women. It's a, it's a rude and um, very presumptuous uh, attack on women, calling them unconstant. In other words, unfaithful, forward, lewd, idle, idle meaning lazy, lewd meaning immoral. Uh, anyway, while Swetnam published his work under the pseudonym of Thomas Teltroth, Troth meaning truth, Thomas Tell Truth, in other words. So he actually used a pseudonym. Rachel had the courage and internal conviction enough to sign her own real name to the 1617 publication of her rebuttal. A muzzle from Elastinus, the cynical baiter of and foul mouther Barker against Eve's sex. So she used, she cast him as like a dog in this because a melastomus, you know, a muzzle for melastomus, and meaning that dark mouth. Uh, and she's calling him a cynical baiter of and foul mouther, foul mouther barker. So again, a bark, you know, continuing that um, image of him as a dog um, against Eve's sex. So Eve, you know, meaning like how often are women depicted in a certain negative light because they are considered to be, you know, women, the descendants of Eve, the temptress, right? Uh, and, and Rachel even addresses this work to women. She says, hey, women, here we are. Read it. I'm addressing you. Read this. I'm rebutting this man who attacked our entire uh, female biological sex here. Uh, this address to female read readers is revolutionary in its thinking because it presupposes that women will read her work right pretty amazing because women weren't educated you know for the most part they couldn't attend schools but the ones that were educated were educated because they had access to great libraries and or they had uh tutors in the home that they could listen to all right so she is presuming that women can actually read what she's writing so we've seen a lot of progression here at this point um so she there is there are a growing number of women who can who can both read and write at this time period um, and she addresses that. So anyway, it was rare for women to be educated at this time. It was even rarer for women, especially a young single woman, to write and, and, uh, and publish their own writings and under their own name, no less. In fact, we will see throughout our course that women long have published under male pseudonyms to avoid criticism and social scorn and protect sales of their works. You know, we even had like J.K. Rowling from the 20th and 21st centuries, right? She used the initials, her initials JK, instead of saying her name because she was worried that people wouldn't want to buy a book about a boy wizard if it was written by a woman. So she used JK, her initials, instead of her female name. So even up into the modern times, do we still have that pressure um, working against women using their full female names? A muzzled melastomus is logically organized and very clearly structured. That logic and the structure Rachel uses by addressing Swetnam's arguments in terms of Aristotelian causes. So Aristotelian meaning it comes from Aristotle. He, he has four causes, you know, um, and you'll, you'll see them as you read the footnote and read through um, a muzzled melastomus, um, Aristotle's four causes. And so by her writing about the four causes herself, it shows she's educated. She knows Aristotle's works and she knows he writes about the four causes um, as a way to um, talk about the essence of something and to address the essence of something and even to argue against um, certain things. So um, it shows that she's unusually educated. Rachel determines the four objections that Swetnam has against women and then systematically addresses them thoroughly and convincingly. We'll take a look at those four arguments and how she addresses them. Rachel takes on the stereotypical associations of women with Eve and Eve's transgression and turns Eve's act into one that welcomes grace. So she turns that act on its head. While it's been so long throughout history used to uh, paint women in a negative light, and um, to rank them underneath men, she instead takes 
back that act and turns it into a positive one. All right. So again, great way to object to um, address and rebut an argument against women, right? Is to take that, take that by the horns and use it to create um, an argument for, um, for women and for the positive you know, positive uh, spin on their actions. This work was so well known and noteworthy at the time that some people argued that Rachel must have published her father's writing instead of her own because it was so well done. Uh, and people didn't think women could be that well educated or that smart to write that well. So she, um, her swift and deft arguments use Aristotle's four causes to glorify wo womanhood. And she uses Eve's action as really a pursuit of knowledge in and of itself. She says, hey, she ate, she partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because she wanted knowledge. She wanted to become like God. She wanted to gain that godly knowledge. And so what she was doing, although it brought, you know, although it violated the commandment of God, it was to pursue what she feels is that message from the parable of talents, which is we go after godly knowledge. And when we're blessed with talents, we use them and we develop them and we use them to benefit humanity. We benefited humanity by going after that knowledge of good and evil and um, by inviting Adam also to pursue the knowledge of good and evil. So there's an interesting spin on that, one that we hadn't really heard till this point. Not saying that nobody's ever made that argument, but we hadn't encountered it until we read a muzzle from Elastimus here. Anyway, um, such accusations that in, um, encouraged her to narrate her own educational journey in the aforementioned A Dream of Fixed. So because people are accusing her of using her father's writing and passing it off as their own, that was another reason that she was inspired to write a dream affixed her educational journey to show exactly how she did learn what she learned and how she overcame those doubts and and dissuasion that society puts, up, puts upon women. So anyway, neat work that we read and I hope you enjoy it. All right. Thank you. Enjoy.